Alhamdulillah. Summa alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Alhamdulillah ala ni'mat al-Islam. Nasta'inuhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'inuhu wa azza wa jal Man yahdi lillah thalamu din lillah wa man yulil thalahadi yalah wa nashhadu wa la ilaha illa Allah wahdahu la sharika lah lahu al-mulku wa lahu al-hamdu wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir wa nashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم. We begin by praising Allah God Almighty, praising Him for the blessing of this Deen, is called Islam or Al Islam. We seek His assistance, His guidance, His forgiveness, and proclaim our belief and trust in Him. Those whom Allah delivers guidance, none can take those persons astray and those whom have not been provided guidance cannot be provided guidance by any and we affirm that God alone deserves worship subhanahu wa ta'ala and that he has sent prophets and he has sent messengers throughout time and we affirm that this process is concluded with the coming of the final prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the final prophet I would like to begin today's khutbah, or I should say center today's khutbah around a certain premise that is given in the Qur'an in which it says قُلْ إِنَّ هُدَى اللَّهِ هُوَ الْهُدَى It says, say, the guidance of Allah is that is the real guidance, or that is the sufficient guidance. قُلْ إِنَّ هُدَى اللَّهِ هُوَ الْهُدَى And in addition to this ayah, this statement from the Qur'an, we have another statement, one which the Imam usually reads out in the courses of his Friday khutbah. And that statement, I already translated it earlier. مَنْ يَهْدِ لَهُ فَلَا مُدِلْ لَهُ وَمَنْ يُدِلْ فَلَا هَادِيَ لَهُ that those whom Allah gives guidance, none can mislead those people or take those people away. And similarly, those whom He has not provided guidance cannot be guided by any. Obviously, there are many elements or dimensions within these Quranic sentences. However, I would like to look at the idea of guidance. I want to look at that idea, the idea of guidance. And I would like to share the analogy of the instructions that a patient receives from his doctor or from her doctor. The physician, the doctor, prescribes a certain prescription. He writes out the script. He writes out instructions as to how much of this medicine you're to take or how you must, how with the diet that he wants you to have or the sort of exercises he wants you to perform, the exercises he wants you to do. Now, if the patient does not understand what the physician has said, if the patient didn't hear what the, what the, what the, what the doctor has said, if the patient has, at worst, more than that, if the patient has decided, I'm going to do my own thing, which a lot of people do, if the patient has decided that they are going to ignore the doctor's instructions or they are going to alter the doctor's instructions, obviously what's going to happen? What's going to happen is that the patient's health will not get better. On the contrary, it will become worse. The doctor says you must take such pills at three times a day. Instead, you take it 30 times a day. 
You misread the three, you put a zero on it. Three becomes zero, 30. The doctor wants you to do a three, and you do a 30. Obviously, your health will not improve, but rather it will get worse. The other angle to this The other angle to this is what I would call the combative patient. And there are such people, combative patients. Sometimes there are people who, whose, whose health is, is affecting how they think and how they perceive things. And so it's not that they're intentionally combative, it's just that you know, certain things are going on in the mind which makes them become combative. The other part, the other part of that of the combative, combative uh, patient, combative patient, is the person who relies upon websites and self-help books, thinking that their 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 five-minute Google search is going to somehow. Um, supersede the instructions of the doctor who was more likely spent close to 10 to 15 years in medical school. Your five minutes of med your five minutes of Google is superior thinking that your five minutes of Google is or your purchase of a ten dollar self help book that it is superior to the fifteen years that the that the physician has spent in medical school. Thinking that 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 five minutes of research can outdo the training and, or, or I should say, outdo the guidance or the advice of the doctor. So it is precise, it is this situation precisely that we see today, in today's world, and particularly in relation to Islam, in relation to how Islam is understood. And this is not a phenomenon that is just experienced among non Muslims. Because that's actually understandable. A non-Muslim, more likely, is not going to have a lot of understanding about Islam because it's not his religion or her religion. But this is a phenomenon, or this is a situation that is increasingly being found among Muslims. Among people who do recite the kalima, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. We can see, or we should see, uh, before I even continue, we should we should see the the importance of the Prophet's way, Prophet Muhammad's way, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. We can see the importance of his way of opening up the Friday khutbah. One of the things that he says, and I should follow this. I, n I normally don't, but I should follow this sunnah. He says, "Munaudu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyati amalina." This is one of the things that, that the Prophet, uh, peace be upon him, would say in the Friday sermon. And we seek refuge with God. This is the Prophet's uh, statement in the Friday khutbah. We seek refuge with God from the harm that emanates from within our own selves. Min shururi and fusina. From the harm that emanates from within. And from women sa'iyati amalina. And from the... Um, uh, from the from the bad consequences of our own actions. You notice that most of the Imams, wherever you go in the world, it doesn't matter Sunni, Shia, or whatever, most of the Imams, when you go around the world, when they give their Friday uh, sermon, Friday uh, khutbah, they will make that statement. So we should see the importance of, of that of that prophetic practice. So, we need Islam. And we don't need some of it. We need all of it. The doctor gives you a prescription. He tells you to take the pills or whatever, five times, excuse me, three times a day. And if you take it only once a day, then you're altering what the, what the doctor has, has prescribed. If you take it 30 times a day, you, you are really alter what the doctor has prescribed. And you'll have a terrible result. So we need all of Islam. Because it is 
completed, this is our belief at least, it is completed and perfected by God. Let me add to this that throughout the Quran, this should be axiomatic truth among Muslims, is that uh, Jesus and Abraham and Moses and all these other prophets السلام, that they are also Muslims, they're all teaching Islam and they are they are like bricks in the building. This is hadith of the Prophet. They are all like bricks in the building. And Muhammad is just the last brick. So, and this is what we say, it's been perfected and completed by Allah. So, how do we come to this point? Or how do we get it? Now, returning to the analogy of the, of the, of the, of the doctor. The doctor, if the doctor is wise, and if the doctor has experience, will know how to do it. He'll know how to um, not only give you the prescription, but to but to explain it to you in a in a, in a way that you're going to understand. And the doctor knows that too little of the medicine or too much of the medicine is going to bring more harm than benefit. You know, recently I was asked a question by a non-Muslim. And I swear to God, before I had a chance to open my mouth, this person already had an answer. Before I had a chance to open up these two lips, the person already had an answer. And as I was, I was, it wasn't like it was a 10 minute or 15 or 30 minute interval. It was just not even 30 seconds. And I, I immediately recognized the, the uh, background of this person, the religious background of this person or the educational background of this person. And you, know, so you have to know that when you're giving answers to the questions. So you have to understand, the, the, the doctor has to understand the, the, where is that person coming from? You know, and your answer to some, and your answer, and the prophet was very good about this, by the way, so long, uh, Salam is very good at this. When, the, when people would ask the prophet questions, and how he answered is how, because he was able to determine this is the level that the person uh, this is the answer that, that, the, that the person requires. This is the level that this person is at. And so I recognize that, but within the maybe 15 seconds, before I could even open my mouth, this person had already proclaimed uh, an answer and yelled, and yelled a conclusion. I don't want to share what that conclusion is. But our, it was uh, basically screaming a response. So... In this regard, the point is both for the questioner and those who answer the question. And this is advice not just for imams or, or speakers, but for all of us. Because all of us are people who are, we, we ask questions, and, so, and more likely we are asked questions. Especially those of you Muslims who wear these kind of funny hats. And, uh, and ladies who wear hijab on a regular basis, etc. You're asked questions. Whether you want to be asked or not, whether you're super religious or not, you're asked questions. So, when it comes to religious issues, to issues of Islam, uh, of history, of the, the history of Muslims, the history of the Muslim civilization or the Islamic civilization, or any other important subject. It doesn't have to involve Islam or have to involve Muslims or whatever. It could be a scientific uh, issue or medical issue or theoretical issue or philosophical issue. One of the things that we need to learn is that answers cannot always be one word answers or cannot always be quick answers because often you're not doing justice to the subject to which you to you're not doing uh, justice to the subject at hand so you know this is a silly not a silly example but this is an example you know how
how can we explain something about something that's found in the hadith literature or in tarikh in, in history how can we answer a question that's based on sources like that when the person himself or herself doesn't even know what a hadith is and the person himself or herself has never studied anything in history at all perhaps has never has not graduated high school and this is again for all of us not just one person or another person so if we ever struggle with Islam if we struggle with understanding his teachings, this is for ourselves. If we struggle with Islam, if we struggle with his teachings, or we struggle with, with history, you're trying to answer, you know, well, this thing that happened in history, this thing that happened in history, or may or may not have happened, we should follow the advice of the Quran. We should follow the advice of the Quran. Actually, I should not use the word advice, I should use the word command. I shouldn't use the word advice. And that that's in that amr, the command is Fas al Ahl Zikri in Kuntum La Ta'alamun. Ask those who know if you do not know. I shared this story a couple of times. Imam Mashafari, Rahmatullahi Alay. A mulhid, you know, an atheist, comes to him and he says, Is it true that the Quran contains all things or explains all things? To Biyana lil kulli shay? And Imam says, Yes. He says, Okay, I got one for you. Where does it say in the Quran how to bake bread? He says, Okay, I'll let you know. Let me find it for you. So the man comes around, the mulhid comes around later on. It says, oh, where is it? What verse says how to bake bread? So he tells him the process. So the man replies, I don't remember reading that in the Quran. He says, oh, yes. Ask those who know if you don't know. So what I did was, after I went and asked a baker, and he told me how to do it. <laughs> so see, it's already there in the Quran. <laughs> In addition to this advice, excuse me, I keep I keep saying the wrong thing. In addition to this command, this um, we should understand that you know the, the real goal as as religious people should not be simply to be able to quote statements to make yourself sound good. That should not be the real goal. That's ego driven, to be honest. Or ego building, maybe there's a better expression. The real goal is not to be able to quote to give quotations. Rather, the real goal is having divine guidance. Having divine guidance as a foundation, or having a foundation for, our, for divine guidance in our own practical lives. This is the real goal. So you're not a Muslim, so you can oppose a Christian or a Jew or a Hindu or whatever. You are a Muslim because you believe that this is the path of God. That this is what this is this is this is the item, this is the vehicle that's gonna take you to where you wanna go. We call it Asirat al Mustaqim, the straight path. So the Qur'an is the foundation and the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the final Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is our practical example in terms of becoming connected to Allah. لَقَدَ كَانَ لَكُمْ Allah says لَقَدَ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهَ لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهَ وَيَوْمُ الْآخِرِ وَذَكَرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا Indeed you have in the Messenger of God 
a goodly model for any who has hope in God and in the final day and who who will contemplate upon Allah in abundance. So, do have these things or have this notion that we that we are really just seeking divine guidance. Have that as being the most important goal of being connected to Allah. And we are when you are connected to Allah in a strong way. This is my experience, and this is the experience of many people. When you are connected to Allah in a strong way, to be honest with you, some questions are even going to matter. Really, some questions aren't really going to matter. What 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 sort of branch did the Prophet use for the miswag? Like which 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 tree did it come from? Who cares? What color were Jesus' socks? Who cares? Really? <laughs> some questions are not going to matter, and some questions will answer themselves. Really, some questions will answer themselves. And as you develop, you will discover that some questions will, are, are, again, are just absolutely unnecessary. And so let us uh, conclude the first section of the khutbah. We're almost finished. Let us conclude the first section of the khutbah with the prayer of the Prophet, the dua of the Prophet wasallam, in which he prays, and we should pray the same, to Allah to give us useful knowledge and halal goodly provision and for deeds that are acceptable in His sight. Allahumma inna nas'alaka ilman nafi'an wa rizqan halalan tayyiban wa amalan mutakabban bi rahmatika ya arhamar rahimin. Aqbalu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نحمده ونصلي على رسوله الكريم. Returning to the issue of guidance, and this is perhaps the most important part of what I want to say today. What does guidance look like? Does it have a form in the figure? What does it look like? The answer to this question, this very important question, the answer to this is given in the surah that we recite every day when we pray. Here it is. Guide us upon the straight path. But what path, what, what, well again, what does that path look like? Is it Bancroft streets or or main streets? What does it look like? Sirat al ladina and Amta Arihim Ghair al Mahdubi Arihim Waladalim. This is what it looks like. The path, the Sirat, the path of those whom you have given, you meaning God. The path of those whom you have given bounty, grace, blessing, ni'mah. The path of those whom you have given ni'mah. غَيْرِ الْمَغْدُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَالْمَالِينَ Not the path of those with whom you are angered with. Those who have incurred divine anger. Nor the path, not that path which takes us astray, which makes us go astray. So, the uniform of guidance, what guidance looks like, the uniform of success, the uniform of guidance is that which has in it ni'mah. So, ni'mah, bounty, blessing, grace, you know, you can translate this in a, in a lot of ways, and most of us, even non-Arabic uh, speakers, have the word ni'mah in our languages, so it's, no, it's not almost unnecessary to translate. Ni'mah is woven into the tapestry of guidance. 
just as the threads are woven into this shirt, into our shirt and our pants, etc. Ni'mah is woven into the tapestry of guidance. Meaning, you feel the blessings of Allah. Even if you are poor, you feel the blessings of Allah. Even if you are unhealthy, you, you feel the blessings of Allah. And as Allah says in the Quran, وَإِن تُعُبْتُوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْزُوهَا if you try to count the ni'mah of a God, you will not be able to do so. Having that attitude is an expression of guidance or a, an attribute of guidance. And guidance, we're almost finished, God willing. Guidance is shown by avoiding, this is what the Fatiha teaches us. And remember the Prophet says that Pray, that when you pray, the Fatiha is a necessity for prayer. The Prophet says that, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, any prayer in which Fatiha is not included therein is a ghayr tamam. It's incomplete. This is, what this, this is what the Prophet teaches about this surah. So guidance is shown by avoiding that which brings forth divine anger. Now comes the question. It's a very good question. What brings forth divine anger? The Qur'an mentions a few examples. Uh, it mentions, for example, kuf, rejection. It mentions killing of prophets. It mentions seeking out divine magic tricks. It even mentions gluttony. And it may be a, a, a good idea for someone to publish, maybe I should do it, because I'm saying it. Maybe a good idea to publish a study or publish a paper on ghadab or um, um, anger as mentioned in the Qur'an. And I have this here. Um, in Arabic it's called Nujum al-Furqani fi atraf al- excuse me, Nujum al-Furqani fi atraf al-Qur'an. And uh, basically it's a fahras. And if you want to see how many times is ghadab mentioned. You know this book it tells you where, you know, say fahras, it shows you where it, it, where it is, I have a small list here, but it shows you where it is in the Quran where these ideas are mentioned. Like, what is it that bring forth divine anger? Look in the Quran and find out. Now, unfortunately, this book here has uh, all those listings. The way of life is lived by those who have on them divine anger. The Muslim, well, the Muslims are supposed to do the opposite. Really, the Muslims are supposed to do the opposite. Now we understand a hadith in which the Prophet وسلم, is reported to have said, al Mushrikeen, be different from the idolaters. You don't have to be different in language and in dress necessarily. But in way of living, in way of living, the attitude we have is supposed to lead us to be healthy, to lead us to be balanced, filled with understanding, mercy, forgiveness, and gratitude. These are the attributes of, of, of believers. And look at look at Muhammad himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the found the Prophet. Look at him. After two decades of persecution and war and all these things that occurred to him, and we know the basic highlights of it, what did he do when he entered into Mecca, into the enemy capital? He issued an amnesty. An amnesty that even extended to the people who killed his uncle and mutilated his body. And I think all of us know the story about Sayyidina Hamza This is the this is the this is the attribute of someone who is guided. And that's this is the sort of thing that we are to emulate. Not to emulate the way of vengeance and 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 uh, and uh, and anger and vindictiveness. That's not the way of the Prophet. That's not the, that's not the indicator of guidance. So keeping with certain ethics and keeping with certain thinking, 
These are the indicators of guidance, not so much our hats, and not so much our clothes, and not so much our passports and, and currency. And that's not all. According to the Quran, guidance just increases. It keeps going. It doesn't say one light. It says light on top of light. Light of one light. Allah guides. Present tense. God guides to his light or with his light. It's been how you interpret uh, Li Nori. God guides to his light or with his light whomsoever he wishes. So, if your life, you are a believer in Allah and His Prophet, and you are a believer in trying to have ethics and, and grow, Allah will give that to you. And the more life you have, the more guidance will increase if the sincerity is there and the effort is there. It's just like work. The more life you have and the more discipline you have, to be careful with your money and to avoid the vices so eat up your money, the more you're going to gain. It's rule it's it's a it's a truism in the physical world, and it's also, or perhaps I should say, more so a truism in the spiritual world. And God is the one who knows all things. Allah knows what He's doing. Allah knows what He's doing. We may not always know, but Allah knows. And the more you seek to be connected to Him, the more that knowledge is going to be given to you in such a way that you will feel the guidance. So we pray into Allah. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his guidance. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his mercy, for his forgiveness. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fi la akhirati hasana wa qina azab al-nar. Rabbana la taj'alna ma'al qawm al-thalameen. Rabbana amanna faqtubna ma'al shahideen. Rabbana la tuzam qulubana ba'at iz hataytana muhablana billa duka rahma. Innaka anta al-wahab. ربنا إنك جامع الناس ليوم لا ريب فيه إن الله لا يخلف ميعاد سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يسيفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين آمين أكيم الصلاة إن الصلاة كانت على مؤمنين كتابا أو خوتا I'm going to go to the house. 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 I'm going to go to the house.